My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. I'm Lauren Bradley. Today's leadership quote comes from Conan O'Brien. Nobody really knows what they're doing. And there's two ways to go with that information. One is to be afraid and the other is to be liberated. And I choose to be liberated by it. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. Hey friends, thanks for tuning in. Before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to let you know about my new audio course in partnership with Himalaya Learning. It's called Seven Keys to Reclaiming Your Time, Energy, and Productivity, and it's available exclusively on Himalaya Learning. Himalaya Learning is an audio learning platform that provides bite-sized courses from world-class thinkers and industry experts to fuel your personal and professional growth. To access my course and others like it, go to Himalaya.com forward slash keys and enter the promo code K-E-Y-S for your free 14-day trial. Again, Himalaya.com slash keys, enter the promo code keys for your 14-day free trial. I hope you enjoy it. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Leader Assistant Podcast. It's your host, Jeremy Burrows, and today I'm speaking with Lauren Bradley. Lauren is the founder of of The Officials, an online platform that empowers assistants through community courses and coaching. And she is also currently a private PA to high net worth individuals. Lauren, how's it going? It's going okay. It's going good here. And where is here? So I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but I live in uh, just south of London in the UK. Awesome. And you work uh, remotely, is that right? So I mostly work remotely. I um, I do visit my uh, for hire. I'm like a private PA for hire. So I have a few clients and I go into their homes maybe once a week, some not at all, um, just maybe once a month if they need me. Uh, but the longer I've worked with them, the less I need to actually physically go in. But I do have, still have one client that I go in um, half a day a week. But mostly, I'm almost 100% remote. Awesome. So let's step back a little bit and tell us about your very first job and or maybe first couple jobs and what skills you learned in those roles that you still use today. Yeah, that was that's a tough question because it's like, which which one? Which air, like era of my life is it? So my very first job ever was probably working for my father who owns his own commercial cleaning business, uh, cleaning office buildings, medical offices, daycares, um, with a crew at night. And sometimes, you know, it's hard to find workers that are willing to do that in the middle of the night. And, uh, so sometimes in the summer, his workers were his kids (laughs) (laughs) and I learned a lot about cleaning I learned a lot about physical hard work and what it's like to manage a team, um, what it's like to have personal risk in your own business. Uh, I remember him actually starting the business and getting the business cards, how exciting it was, and then the stressful days when you're chasing for payments, Um, and really what it takes to build a business and still be nice to customers if they're they're complaining about something that you can't control or are asking you to do more work when they still haven't paid an invoice or three. Um, But I learned quite a lot about what it means to work hard and uh, be an entrepreneur. And then I guess my first real job after that was I started working in restaurants like busing tables and being a hostess. And then I finally buckled and became a waitress because they always had like literally had cash falling out of their pockets. And, um, I learned a lot. I used to work at Denny's and I can tell you right now that the meanest people I've ever met in my entire life are like elderly, um, early churchgoers that come in right after like the earliest mass or the earliest session. They don't mean to be, they just have no filter (laughs) and they make you run 
and uh, they're really cheap. And you understand because they're on a pensioner's budget, um, but you have to work twice as hard for them. And uh, but I learned that, like, you can't have a bad day because in America, where you get paid a very you get paid less than minimum wage an hour and you have to make it up in your tips. If you have a bad day and you take it on the customer, you're not going to get paid. And so uh, I learned a lot about that, the power of saying you're sorry and just bonding and over something humble, being humble. And um, one thing I still use today is uh, I was taught by a manager, one in, one out. And that meant when you took a plate off the table and took it into the kitchen, you made sure you grabbed food and took it back out, that you're always, um, you're never satisfied. There's always follow up. Hmm. And, uh, and I learned the thrill of basically making my own money, basically. And so those are my, I would say those are my first jobs, those. Awesome. Yeah. Lots of, uh, applicable lessons. That's for sure. Yeah. There's something from everything. I think you, I can learn, a th- I learn a thousand things a day, I feel. Yeah. So when and why did you become a PA or EA? So my, um, I met my husband on MySpace a long time ago and, uh, he was in London and I was in Pittsburgh. I never had a passport. I think I was 25. And, um, a year and a half later of us starting to talk, we were married and I found myself in London with a resume or as they call it a CV here that didn't really translate well. Nobody really knew how to market me and I was still getting used to new job titles here and how it was just slightly different. It was like being in a world, like in bizarro world where everything is just a little bit different, like being in the upside down. And, uh, but everyone speaks the same language. And so a friend of mine was in medical school and had been temping and said, you should really do this. It's easy. Uh, and I was terrified. I thought it would be like starting a new, like the first day of starting a new job where you're trying to remember everyone's name and, and what you're supposed to do. And, uh, And it's actually nothing like that. They just have one key task they need taken care of, greeting guests, either answering the phone or doing data entry, one of those things. And if you show any initiative and are really friendly, they love you. And I got lots of job offers that way, but I started that way. I started temping that way and I loved it. And I just fell in love with it. I just loved how much I was affecting people's lives every day. And I, uh, for a while, I thought I was supposed to be more than an assistant. And so I still pursued being a, being head of marketing for a remote software desktop solution. And, uh, and then another telecoms company. And then when I was pregnant, I said, I'm not happy with this. You know, I was climbing the ladder, but this is not the trajectory of that I want to go in. And I'm going to go back to being an admin or an assistant or whatever I can find. And it was the best, um, the best decision I'd ever made. I could say that. Nice. So how long now have you been kind of in that strictly PA role? So that was, um, so I started temping back in 2008. And so now we're like 12 years on. And though I had, um, I would say like two years where I was doing head of marketing, uh, I was always an admin or an assistant. So I've had basically every title under the sun. I've been an office manager. I've been an EA. I've been a PA. I've been, um, and even in those roles, depending on where I worked, I had, as you know, we wear multiple hats. So, uh, I first started as an office manager and then, um, about two years ago, I was introduced to private PA work, which I'd been trying to break into for years, but, uh, it's all about who, you know, And uh, especially in that world, like they do not go, they don't just look at something online and say, oh, that sounds great. They have to know the person that curates that site. They have to email their friends for any time they want a handyman. They don't bring people into their homes that they don't trust. And they trust people and they'll trust their, if they trust you, they'll trust your opinion. And that's how it's a lot of introduction. And so I was really lucky and I really do love it because it is, and I love that it came from corporate first because I learned so much about organization at a, at a corporate level. And then to be able to bring that into someone's home office, uh, is, has been really helpful. The other way around, I think people struggle from being a, maybe going from a nanny to a private PA to a corporate EA. I think it's, it's more of a, it's more of a leap, Mm. but the other way around is fantastic. 
Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that the, uh, especially when you're at that high level, they they think very corporate. <laughs> typically, yeah, exactly. So. I mean, they have businesses. They, I mean, I work for a film producer, uh, a high net worth lawyer, um, uh, someone whose family owns um, a lot of not fast food, but like. Uh, a lot of a lot of global restaurants um, that you go in and like buy sandwiches, but everyone knows their names. Um, and PR companies, like so, you you're doing both. You're managing their life and their work, essentially. Yeah. So, what was the biggest mistake you made as an, as an assistant? So many, <laughs> <laughs> so many. I mean, I mean, just to like set the record straight, I make a mistake every day, and I know other assistants. Uh, that make a mistake every day. And I think this is why I like that quote by Conan O'Brien, which is that nobody really knows what they're doing, especially in an EA role or an assistant role, because a lot of us haven't gone, we haven't gone to school for an MBA, a lot of us. Um, And 60% of our workforce is in small to medium business. And most likely that means they fell into it and they just were scrappy and figured it out. And so, um, and the close, and the more I work with leaders uh, of companies, and the real, more I realize that they don't really know what they're doing either. They just have the gall and the gumption to do it, and they just uh, and they serve as their service led leaders. And so that has been really helpful to one admit that I make mistakes, just like anybody else. And I think I try and tell that to everybody because I know so many assistants that are like absolutely losing their minds, fretting every day over what mistake they might've made. We're not meant to be perfectionists, but we're meant to learn from our mistakes and try and systematize so that we can prevent them from happening again. But one is I make mistakes. And, um, one of the mistakes I made was in the very beginning of my career, I was a yes person to the point of being subservient and, um, and thinking, Oh, they're the great leader. And I'm, the piddly assistant. And I just, you know, of course I'll make you happy, whatever you want to do, which I think is conditioned in women in general. And, uh, and then one day it was right before I went to a private, it was when I was going to the interview for my first private PA role. And I said, that's it. I am not going to do this anymore. Um, I'd actually come out of of amazing role where I won the office ninjas also work when I was there, um, as an office manager, I was the only admin until I hired another admin for our Philly office that I managed, but they were so wonderful and supportive. This helped me make this decision was that I was going to be a partner. I knew what it really was like to be respected in my work. And I needed a company to show me what real respect and high trust was. I said, that's it. This is how I'm going in. I'm going to be a partner. And, and you have to like start that in your voice from the moment you talk to the recruiter or the interview starts to set that narrative. And that was, so the mistake was that I wasn't doing that early on in my career. And I was then getting, I think that's how some people get jaded and frustrated or just get beat down, burn out. Um, and when I made that decision, it was like the best decision I think I could have made, uh, because I just learned to stand up for myself really and to understand my self-worth and, and other ways that I was doing that without just being a yes person was I was working too late. I was working sometimes till nine, 10 at night on a Friday. And even my boss was like, why are you here? And if the boss is saying, why are you here? You should go home. <laughs> Cause if he's saying I'm, this isn't worth my time to stay here. Then what was on, what was I doing there? And, and like when you calculate what your hourly rate is, if you're a salaried employee and you go from what your weekly rate is and divide that by 40 hours and then divide that by the true amount of hours that you're working, you see how much you're giving away. And that really, um, that really helped. And then also the other biggest lesson was following orders too strictly. Um, I got burned really badly in my first role because I was told to always make sure the boardroom was clear at lunchtime because they had had to turn the break room into more offices. And so no one had anyone to eat and they weren't allowed to eat at their desks. And we had a big meeting in there with a big, um, a vendor of ours that we needed to have a really good relationship with. And they were training and I kept coming in and knocking on the door saying, you gotta go, you guys, sorry, you really need this room. And what I should have done is just told everyone to eat at their damn desks. And I made an enemy that day because they were horribly embarrassed 
and really didn't understand why I couldn't just think for myself and say, and judge the situation. But I also didn't know it was the vendor, but I learned that I should be more autonomous and make decisions for myself because I felt like it was wrong. I didn't want to go in there and embarrass myself, keep bothering them. But I kept thinking, well, they told me to do this, so I'll do it. Mm. And I even got in trouble from the CEO who told me to do that because I just didn't think for myself. So that was, those are my two big things that like change the way I work. So how can, let's talk about culture a little bit. How can assistants build and keep a company's culture? So it depends. If you already have a great company culture, then it's really just culture keeping. If you don't feel that there is a real culture, then it's, well, where do you start? How do you turn, do a U-turn on the company culture? How do you change it and start pushing it in the way that you want to go? And one, I think it's through looking at the company's values. It depends on how big the company is. So like, the people that I talk to the most, the assistants and the admins I talk to the most are in small to medium businesses. They might not even know, the company might not even have any defined values. So you kind of have to go looking for them. If you have a set already, great. If you don't, then you kind of have to think, why do people want to work here? What kind of people are we always looking for that really seem to be great at sticking around? What do our customers like about us? And that starts to bring up some keywords. And then like, what kind of work does your company do? What do they stand for? What are they really, what is the real challenge statement of your company, which you usually find in the mission statement if it's, if you have one. Um, and then it's making sure that you have buy-in from the top down, really making sure you have buy-in. Like they've given you enough budget to do the type of cultural events you want to do. And then I think a lot of that is about around bonding after you de- determine what those values are. And, and what your company stands for is doing a lot of bonding around that. If you're building a culture and I think startups really do this well because they, I think in general, I think what's coming out of, uh, especially kind of this quarantine time that we're in and, um, is that when you have constraints, you have a lot of creativity. And so that's what happens with startups. They're constrained. They don't have the budgets to pay big salaries all the time. So they throw in all the bonus features. They buy them Xboxes and switches and they have uh, free lunch and, and bonus massages and things. Cause it, they, even though they're paying money and other companies don't do that, they're, they're improving their life if they can't improve their salary to make them more uh, valuable. And that's kind of what you have to do when it comes to uh, company culture is if you, it's when you look at the constraints of what you have, how much budget, budget you have, how many people you have and uh, what your values are and then start creating activities and content based on that to provide to your team. I used to do a friendly assistant newsletter that went out every week to the whole staff because I was sick of bombarding them with, especially when you're small to medium business, you end up having, um, you end up having so many notifications, like you're doing every job. And so you have to tell everybody, oh, don't forget this is happening, this fire drill, this company stand up. And so I would just, I was sick of hitting them all the time. So I would bundle it up into a newsletter, filled it with memes and funny things. Uh, and that all really tied around, like if we, we were big into charity and philanthropy. And so we would always be doing a new monthly charity fundraiser. Uh, we'd be doing escape the room, um, events, things like that, that just bonded everyone, kept them together and then just kept going. But that's where I would start. Start with your company values and then start creating content and culture and social events around that. I feel like in a small to medium business anyway, that's like the fastest way you can start to build a real feeling and culture. And there's a difference between culture and click. Click is when you're exclusive, you're actually excluding people and you have to make sure that you're including everyone. That's great. Great tips. So what's one thing that assistants can do to be a better strategic partner with their executive? I think one is like just going back to what I said about being a partner and realizing that you're you're an integral member of a team and that uh, everyone is a peer. I think on the assistant side, that's really important to realize that we are all human. I say this over and over and over again to mentees because I find a lot of the things that 
they might come to you and say, oh, I need help with time management or I have gaps in my skills. But really, it always comes down to confidence, almost always. And um, and it's remembering that we're all human. You know, your boss might be Susan or George, you know, that seems this amazing leader. But if they were your next door neighbor, you'd still see them like picking up their mail in their robe. You know, they, they, it's, you have to see them outside of work sometimes to understand that they are still just human. And I feel like that's what those bonding events kind of do as well. They break down those barriers. And so one, go in and bond in some way. I like to start talking about something that's other than work. Uh, when I first meet someone and then I go in hard and say, okay, what are the company's goals? What are your goals? We're going to do this together and really establishing that narrative from day one. Um, and so, because if you, I can tell someone till they're blue in the face, uh, I can build up their confidence. I can tell them how amazing they are. I can skill them up, but if they work for an executive that doesn't appreciate and understand how to wield an assistant in the right way, that is a, um, growth accelerator and a true partner, then it's just, they're going to be left feeling impotent. The assistant, they're just going to feel uh, totally knocked down again. And so one of the ways that I tell people to, to combat that and help mitigate that risk is by speaking as a partner, as a leader, um, as an equal from the moment you start interacting with that company. And I think a lot of people find this easier to switch when they move to a new role than they are able to in their own role, that that's totally possible. If someone's ready to make this switch now, I work with them to, to help do it in a, in a more gradual way. Cause I, if, I think I've had experience where I suddenly got sick of being kind of walked on a little bit, which I had totally become a part of that narrative. And when you finally put your foot down, Oh, it, it's like, they don't even know you. Right. <laughs> and so that's not good. That's not what you want either. So I think it does have to be gradual. It does have to be starting to assert yourself and, and, and even assert sounds too strong, but just start to actually show you have an opinion and, and it's the, the tone of your voice that just shows that, you know, what you're talking about, you've thought about this and, um, and just being able to wield that from, from as soon, as soon as possible. Um, and I think that really helps make an assistant, a better executive partner, and it helps an executive to ex- expect this from the very beginning. Like this is how we're going to work together. Hmm. So what about interruptions. What's your best tip for managing constant interruptions? So that's a very good question because well, one, it happens to everybody. And I think it's, it's a question, not just specific to assistants, especially just when there's so much that needs to happen in a day at work and, um, how globally connected we all are and talking in Slack and I mean, like trying to track where all my messages come from, WhatsApp, Slack, LinkedIn, Instagram. I mean, from, these are from work people, (laughs) uh, emails, phone calls, like how do you keep it all together? So what I like to do is listen to them. I never say to anyone, if they've walked up to my desk, if I'm in a physical office and they've walked up to my desk, I actually invite that. I, I, one of my tips for when anyone's new in a new role is put a big old bowl of sweets or candy on your desk. People will come over and be real nice to you and get to know you. Um, you're the one that brought them candy. So, uh, or fruit or whatever works for you. But, um, so I, I actually invited constant inter- interruptions so that I could bond with people. And then you have to kind of slow that down. And the way I would do that was listen to them, tell them what I was currently, like, I'm currently working on something. I really want to help you. If you're okay with waiting, I can fit you in at this time and literally schedule everything. So if they make a request, request, I schedule it. Uh, or I tell them to email it to me. Uh, and just being able to quickly identify how urgent the request is, because sometimes they just, you just have to have those interruptions. Identify how quick the request, or how urgent the request is. Then if it's not that urgent, make sure that they send you an email, which is normally where I triage my requests and my, um, information. And, or if I'm like, if I would be running to the bathroom or something and someone stops me to tell me we're out of paper or they need to set up a meeting, I use Siri a lot on my iPhone. And I just say, Siri, remind me in 10 minutes to do this, stick it back in my pocket and go. But I just try to make sure those interactions are short and I schedule them for the future if they're not urgent. 
that's that's the best I can say. I don't think I think people time block, which I think is important too. And you kind of set a you set a precedent and say like this time that this is I do that a lot on finance days. If I'm helping a client with their invoice, saying I really need to put my head down on finance days, and even they know that. Even my clients know they little interruption on those days so I can get what I need done. And so, and I, but I don't have to do that too often in what I do now. Um, as far as like telling everyone that I work with, don't interrupt me during these times, but I just make sure I schedule to follow up with them later if it isn't urgent or, uh, make sure that I tell them that these specific times or are for sort of important projects, which I rarely have to, but I know another, a lot of other assistants should be doing that more often than myself. But those are, that's the two things I would say. Great. So let's talk a little bit about the officials and I'm going to preempt it with this question. How can an assistant grow existing skills and develop new skills? Uh, and then maybe you can use this to transition into talking a little bit about what you're doing to provide tools and resources for assistants. Sure. Um, so I, I'll start by saying that my career for the first eight years of my career, I was the only admin or assistant in my company. And I worked for several companies and I was always the only one. I never had a mentor. I never had any training. I fell into it like so many that I meet. And, uh, and you just, you know, university of Google, you learn, you just learn. And, uh, and I knew there was training out there. Um, I knew there were professional bodies but to be honest, not a single company I worked for would have been able to pay me, pay for me to attend anything that I went to. And I was also bottom of the totem pole um, at a lot of places where some places they would have paid for it in a heartbeat if they had the money. But it was a startup and they're always looking for new funding. And uh, we all just have to pull our weight. And in other places, it was I was just ne they would give the funding to someone else before they would give it to me, especially when you're the person that is supposed to be the person that just figures stuff out. Like that's your superpower. So it was very hard for me to find affordable, accessible training, especially when I, in New York, there was more accessible training, but I also had a child that I had to race back to New Jersey when I lived, I lived in New York for a while, um, to get my baby out of daycare at six 30. And so I didn't have time to go to networking events and, and learning events at night. So I ended up starting a community when I was living in New York. I'd left London for a few years and came back and um, my little black book was just useless. And so I really needed to connect and learn. And so one, I found a network. And I think that's really important. Um, you can learn a lot by just talking to others. And, um, and that was really helpful. It helped me learn without having to break my own pocketbook or um, have to burden that at my company that I knew truly couldn't provide that for me. And, um, and the next is that I think the whole way that we are educating ourselves is changing. Uh, I worked in higher ed for a long time. I studied instructional design. Like I am a teacher in my bones. Like I taught, I, I taught an art college. I taught graphic design and Adobe software. Like it is it is just inside me to want to share knowledge with others. And I feel like that in a community, that's essentially what you're doing. So I started the officials as a community. And, um, and I think now you're, there's all of these, um, online courses, I think, as you know, uh, as we, we all are different, uh, offerings are, are popping up here and there. Lots of admin assistant communities are popping up, which I think is so incredible. Um, and that's, and what I think is unique about the officials is I'm talking to mostly women, mostly newer in their career. Actually, it's not even true. I, I actually, a lot of my assistants, a lot of my members are, are seasoned over 10 years seasoned. It's a, it's a good mix. And, um, mostly in small to medium businesses, they've never had training, real official training. They don't really have a training budget and but they're crafty and they're scrappy and they just want, are so thirsty to learn. And that's who I wanted to serve. Um, those are my people. And, uh, and so I started thinking, okay, how can I help? How can I help? It started with mentoring. People started reaching out in the community and asking me to mentor them. And I had like 20 requests at once in one month. And I was like, how do I help? Paul? I can't 
do this for all these people. So I created a program and then they all ask the same questions. It always comes down to confidence. How do you be influential? How do you change that narrative? How do you speak as a leader? How do you speak to leaders? Um, then there's big gaps in our knowledge because we have to figure it out ourselves. They don't like literally just little tiny tricks in outlook, like the new versions of outlook. It's not that easy to figure out how to bring up mail and calendar side by side. I can't tell you many people I've just shown how to do that to, and it's blown their minds. Like it's saved them so much time every single day, um, because of these just little gaps. And, uh, and so I started based on everything that was coming out of these mentorship sessions, I started building courses. And, um, so if you are someone who's looking to grow existing skills, develop new skills, um, there is so much on offer right now online in communities. Those would be my two things. Start doing research, start determining what your budget is. Do you have a budget? Are you able to go out and go to like physical events? Is it better for you to go online? Um, and so for my community, it's better to be an online platform and, uh, with some events, uh, physical events. And, um, and I try and make all of the content really easily digestible video tutorials that are only a few minutes long. Uh, each bit of information that I try and teach people, it takes up maybe a half a page. It's like really practical language, um, where it's just like, I'm your office bestie. That's what it is. I'm the, I'm the friend that's going to pull my chair up next to you when you're overworked and you have to work through lunch and I'm going to share my wilted salad, salad with you. I'm going to say, what's going on? Okay. How can we break this down into chunks? Here's a whole bunch of templates I've done on that already. Oh, don't worry. I know about this. Let me help you with that. And that's sort of my whole attitude around training. And that's how, um, that's what I bring to the table and the officials anyway. So th that would be my advice and also a little bit about kind of what we do here. Awesome. So you kind of talked a little bit about this, but I'm still going to ask the question anyway. What makes an assistant a leader? So I, I personally love leaders that serve. And assistants have serving hearts uh, mostly. And I really... Like I said, those are my people, the people that really genuinely want to They've chosen for a career to help someone else as a career. Um, and that to me makes you a leader. If you are genuinely trying to lift others up, if we can all rise up together, then um, that alone makes you a leader. But if you if you're interested in being more influential and in finding your voice, I think that one of the best things you could do is learn by modeling. You don't have to become someone else, but there's just certain people in your life, a parent, a grandparent, um, a really great boss that you had in the, in the past. Um, just someone that when they talk, others want to listen and just, you find you want to just please them and do, you know, when they say, okay, we're going to start this new project and this is how it's going to be. And I'd really like to get everyone involved. And you know, the, when you just want to go, okay, I'm ready to do whatever you want to do because they have that conviction. And I think that conviction comes from just fully being yourself and really knowing yourself and knowing your skills and knowing that no one knows what the heck they're doing. <laughs> and so why can't it be you? Why can't it be you that takes the initiative? Why can't it be you that, uh, why can't you have a respected voice just as you respect everyone else's voice? So really looking at what makes like a charismatic, a charismatic leader in your life, what makes you drawn to them and practice kind of what they do in the mirror in the morning when you're getting ready, kind of try on that voice, try on that posture. Um, especially if it's something like going for a raise, negotiating for a job title change, um, uh, having a difficult, like, we feel horribly difficult. We have a horrible time just quitting a job because we feel like it's a failure <laughs> we, that we can't help them with everything, even though we want to, we need to move on. This is the right time for us. And so that's a really great time to kind of practice this, um, trying on this leader coat, this influence on influential leader coat, but really it's finding what's already inside of you and just amplifying it really. I love the phrase leader coat. 
Yeah. You should trademark that. <laughs> I'm, I'm literally where I'm sitting, like trying to put on, I'm putting on a fake invisible coat. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Lauren. Well, thank you so much for uh, what you're doing to serve the assistant community. And thank you for sharing your story. Um, where can people find out about the officials and support what you're doing? Um, well, thank you so much for having me. This has been really nice. And uh, it was nice to just talk to another person that knows what it's like. Um, but if anyone wants to find out more about the officials and the affordable and accessible training that we have in the amazing, incredible community um, of admins and assistants, literally all over the world, um, please check us out um, on Instagram at join the officials or um, on our website at jointheofficials.com. Perfect. I'll share those links in the show notes. And yeah, thanks so much uh, again for taking your time to uh, share your tips and we'll talk soon. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren, for a great interview. You can check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash 82. And we'll talk to you next time. Please review on Apple Podcasts. GoBullows.com